pleasure to talk here. You know, uh, I was telling Mike this before that um, you know this this whole um, sort of the Triangle Park area with Mike and Fabian here, Peng and uh, Will Enk at NC State, Landon Cox at Duke. It's becoming a real security powerhouse. So you know, it's uh, it's it's a real pleasure uh, to talk over here. That's that's a picture of uh, Madison in summer. Uh, and I, I, I probably won't show it in uh, what it looks like in winter. Otherwise, it'll be a depressing talk. <laughs> That's true. It looks like that. In, in a month, it'll look like that. So um, essentially, this, this talk has some, some good news, some bad news. And um, since this is a security talk, we'll start with bad news first. OK. Uh, so. Um, if you look, if you're looking for some Halloween time reading, uh, I would suggest to read the Semantic Threat Report uh, from 2010. And essentially, the, the news is all bad. You know, for um, for example, if you look at that report and see where the attacks are emerging from, uh, U.S. is still top on the list, but new countries are pitching in. Like, there's a lot of malicious activity. In Brazil, India, and so on. And you know, if you look, look at the report, it's essentially because the connectivity is increasing in those countries, right? Um, where are the attack targets? What are the attack uh, uh, attackers targeting? Uh, you know, some of the old news, spam, identity theft, and so on. But it looks like there's a huge emergence of hackers that are targeting very specific enterprises. So spam that is, for example, Spam that is targeted right to this department. It'll say, "Hey, uh, and so the Enzo said this," and so it'll actually be very targeted. And these are what is called advanced persistent threats in the in sort of like a lot of the community. Stuxnet is a popular sort of that. Okay, so essentially, I'm scaring you more. I mean, like each slide should be more scary, but I don't see you guys getting scared. Uh, so, what are the uh, uh, vulnerabilities that attackers are exploiting? Uh, mostly web-based. Um, you know, and sort of malicious PDF stuff, which uh, Fabian has done some excellent work in uh, sort of mitigating. Uh, what kind of malwares are more prevalent? Trojans still rule. One of the biggest things that I saw in the report, I mean, I, I read the report probably every year, just uh, mostly being a security researcher, is that the kits to actually write malware, obfuscate malware, become very mature. I mean, you actually, I, you can buy them. On the uh, well, sort of on the, on the market, so so that's kind of the takeaway. Demographics of attack uh, origins is expanding. Web is the major vector of attack. Trojans are the most prevalent form of attack, and you can sort of read the rest. Uh, and uh, essentially, this uh, the report essentially said that the security market in these emerging countries is going to be where the growth is going to be. Okay, good. Uh, I'm not going to talk about defenses, but you can see. For example, in 2009, that was the number of signatures created by Symantec. OK, so uh, I'm not, so the news is pretty grim. And if you want even more grim news, uh, DARPA, I don't know, I didn't see Fabian and Mike there, but DARPA had a cyber colloquium uh, in the early November. And essentially, it was even more grim news, uh, essentially saying that, you know, we're kind of losing the battle, so to speak, at least from their point of view. OK, so what do we do? So where's the good news? So this was the bad news. Now the good news is um, there is a huge uh, push in the networking and the systems uh, community uh, towards clean slate design. People say, you know, we, we're sort of patching signature-based and so on. Um, let's sort of uh, try to think from the beginning and see that if we rethink the entire system stack, do the, will the things get better? Okay. So uh, from the networking side, uh, I think the NSF has a program. And actually, there is a project uh, called cleanslate.stanford.edu. Nick McEwen runs it. And essentially, he's thinking sort of the network architecture from the ground up. I mean, this is the open flow stuff that he's doing. DARPA uh, in computer science, for Fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of the sort of innovations follow the money. <laughs> so DARPA uh, has a mi uh, mission resilient cloud uh, computing, which is essentially you can think about as thinking networking from the ground up 
uh, in clean slate. Okay. Now, what I will be talking about is DARPA has a program called Crash, which is talking about clean slate design for hosts, like from op operating system hardware and so on. And actually, you know, the thing is, it's pretty ambitious program. Some of this might not get into you know, you know the, 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 the sort of, sort of the commodity, but the whole idea is that I think it's a good sort of a mental exercise to see if you're going to do a clean slate design, how how much better can you really do? Okay. Now the good news is there is already, if you look in the systems community, uh, there are some very so. Uh, by the way, I'm not a networking. Uh, I actually, I'm not even a. OS guys, so, but I'm going to mostly talk about hosts here, uh, and uh, not about sort of networks. But there's some interesting things happening in the clean slates uh, side as well over there. So the whole idea is that uh, there's a if you uh, so both like Mike, Fabian, and I sit in more the Usenix security Oakland crowd, but there is a lot of stuff happening in the systems community where they're actually building systems or primitives into systems uh, that have very strong security guarantees. So for example, the first three of them, Asbestos, High Star, Flume, uh, mostly from MIT and Stanford, where they uh, have very strong information flow guarantees built into the OS primitives. Capsicum was in uh, last year at Usenix Security, and it has, it's a, basically a capability-based uh, you know, Unix slash BSD system. Uh, there is also uh, systems that are virtual machine based. For example, Proxys from University of Toronto, essentially what it does is it allows you to have some trusted applications like a VPN client where you, you have credentials to run in its own sort of guest OS and sort of you really sandbox it. So uh, that's not the idea. There are m m many more that I have not uh, sort of put over here. The idea is that in the systems community, they are rethinking, at least, that, OK, you know what? If I want to build some primitives into the OS, what kind of primitives are going to uh, sort of build on? Go ahead. So there is, generally, they have not uh, focused on recovery. And the kind of primitives, you will see some examples. What they will say is that, hey, you can have a, a, a sort of two processes, and they get tags from the OS. And they can only tag if this guy's tag is a subset of this guy. But that those primitives are actually enforced at the OS level. And uh, you'll see some applications uh, I'll talk about. Now, the, the good thing is, if you do a sort of a thought experiment, and, um, is you can think about like, oh, you know, it's not hard to see that I can build a web server on top of High Star that has very strong security guarantees. So it can essentially, I mean, they talk about that in their paper. They can build a web server, which they did for their uh, system, which there's no information flow between threads that are handling different requests. So uh, I'm going to talk uh, one, about one such operating system, and it'll probably, if you, I don't, still don't answer your question, please let me know. OK, but here is what happens. Uh, this laptop, your laptop, probably is not using any of these systems. Right? I'm, I'm assuming if uh, actually they, some of those guys who wrote it use it, but you know, we are not using it. And my thesis, and you know, I'm uh, open to attack and criticism here, but is that a lot of these things don't get used. They, they're, use, they're very useful for people to get tenure and <laughs> get very good papers, but they're never used sort of uh, widely, is because what happens with all the applications that were written for, like, let's say, vanilla Linux, okay? like a web server or a wiki or a, you know, a browser or whatever. So in some sense, a lot of these clean slate systems, which I think is a very good direction, um, will, I think, not get adopted unless there are tools where we can either migrate some of these applications that have been written for traditional OSs or have tools to build uh, applications for these, uh, these clean systems. Yeah. No, so I think the thing is, some of these, uh, I think it will rewriting the code. I mean, I don't know how big is, some of these applications can be millions of lines, right? 
And so what happens is typically, and you will see some of these applications, when you move these applications to, let's say, it is written for Linux, and you move it to one of these, like, high star, the amount of code you have to write to really secure it is not that much. So we are not actually synthesizing the whole program. We are just synthesizing that shimmy that is required to do that. And that's, you, you will see, and we are able to do that because of some of the formal methods and PL tricks. But, uh, I mean, our, our goal is not to sort of rewrite that all the other code is just to, that shimmy of code that you need to run on that operating system. Um, okay, so this is kind of the contraption that we want to build. Uh, you have legacy code, let's say the Apache server that's insecure. You want to migrate it to, let's say, Flume, high start these new systems. And uh, out comes the retrofitted code that is secure. We want to build that beast. Okay, that's that's kind of our uh, goal, and that's why it's called retrofitting legacy code to security. Fabian. Yeah, yeah. I'll, the flume is going to be a running example when I get into the talk. So, if it is not still clear, please let me know. Okay, uh, so essentially this slide you should read as that everything that I know is useful for this problem. So a lot of techniques that are from verification, program analysis can help with this problem. That's essentially our sort of the thesis of this talk and let's see whether you guys buy it still at the end, right? So uh, this won't be useful without uh, or this wouldn't have happened without a lot of the collaboration. Some of the early work was done uh, with Trent Jager and Divya Muthi Kurman from uh, Penn State. Some of uh, the decision stuff is from, uh, I had collaborated with Sanjit Sesha and one of his students, so Smith Jha from Berkeley. But a lot of the work, uh, uh, and also Vinod Ganpati, who's a, one of my ex-students who is at Rutgers now. But a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about is with the student, Bill Harris. This is when he just entered his PhD student. He looks much older now. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, we, have, we, have, uh, we have put him, uh, uh, that's, that's when he just graduated as an undergrad. And Tom Reps, uh, who's uh, in the programming languages community. So most of the work that I'm going to talk about is with Bill and uh, Tom. Actually, he does. He does. I, uh, I think it was funny. He, Tom uh, was at one of my students' defense, and one of my other students thought that he was a grad student. He said, oh, you know, uh, who's your advisor? <laughs> so, yes, he does look like that. This is what good living will do for you, right? Uh, <laughs> so, uh, the paper that I'm going to talk about is called Dipsy Programs by Automatic Instrumentation. And Fabian, this is going to talk about Flume, so you'll get some idea. And uh, this work was uh, done with uh, Bill, uh, in collaboration with Bill Harris and Tom Reps. Okay. So uh, we are now switching. Uh, so again, I said just to say that like, the, a lot of our work is taking this, these systems, taking legacy applications and migrating it to them automatically. So uh, I'll give you a little bit of, uh, as the talk goes, you will see what kind of primitives does these DIFC operating system uh, supports. But we are going to be using here called Flume. We have used the same methodology for other systems. And if you are interested in sort of, we are going to give you a little bit flavor of Flume. But if you are really interested in all the nitty gritty details, uh, the paper appeared in SOSP 2007. Max Krohn has since, uh, he was a uh, faculty at Yale for a little bit. Since then, uh, he has left and he's at a startup now. So he has. Uh, so here is the, uh, uh, I'm going to, I don't like animations that much, so <laughs> here's the basic idea behind these operating systems. The whole idea is this is a mock-up of a web server, and the way you should, I mean, not the whole thing, but just a little bit, the way you should think about this small running example is that uh, all your web requests, HTTP requests, come into this requester, and a worker is spawned to handle that request. And the worker can talk to the requester, and the spawner is what spawns the worker. That's kind of uh, sort of the model. And let's say the worker wants, 
uh, doesn't want, you know, you don't want them, the worker, to talk to the network because they might leak some data about the uh, uh, sort of the request. The requester, because you trust, you want to be able to talk to the network. Okay. Now, let's say you want to enforce this information policy where you can think about green arrows as information flow allowed and red as not information flow allowed at the OS level, at the, let's say, the kernel. Any problems with that? I mean, what do you see? I mean, like, let's say I want to enforce that policy at the kernel. No, just the policy. I mean, the policy is this, that, you know, these guys should be able to talk. These guys should be, this guy should be able to spawn a worker. Red means that information flow not allowed. So let's say this is the policy I'm to enforce. Yeah, just, that's just those over channels. Forget the covert. I mean, I think these things don't also deal with covert channels. This is just over channel. Just the channel that I just, with those arrows. Any, any issues you see? I mean, like, what happens with you? So think about writing this policy at the OS level, right? How does the OS know what is a spawner, what's the worker, what's, what's the bet requester, what is it, so on, right? So the thing is, if you want to write these policies at the OS level, the application semantics has to kind of bleed into the OS, which is not a good thing. Right? So a lot of these systems, Flume, Highstar, and so on, the way they think about it is that we are just going to provide you the primitives to do the enforcement. But the policy uses those primitives but sits in the application. So that means the workers cannot send across the network, is that what you're saying? Yeah. So, so uh, throughout this talk, think about green as information flows that are allowed and red that are not allowed. Uh, Well, so, so maybe in this case you can. You can say, hey, you know, give sort of a small module to the set that something is entering the worker. But imagine in a bigger setting, at a bigger application, if you want to write a policy for the sort of at the OS level, then you have to write the application structure, semantics, all has to bleed in. And so, all I, so this is not our work. All, all I'm saying is that a lot of these systems, the primitives, think essentially give you primitives to enforce the policy, but the policy is actually enforced in the application. So for example, so that's what this essentially says. You know, this will, this will give you uh, the, the new OS flume, and we'll see some applications, will give you enough primitives so that you can do that policy, but you know, the policy kind of sits in the application, but it is enforced in the OS. But you're right. I mean, if you want to expose some of this application state to the OS, you could possibly probably do it. But the, they have not taken that tack. Their whole idea is that we're just going to give you the primitives, and the application actually writes the policy. Mm-hmm. It's not as if it's being asked to decide what the OS knows. Exactly. But that is one application. But let's say I want to say, hey, you know, uh, when you do this, this internal function should not be able to. Yeah. Yeah. So the, what I'm saying is that, uh, that uh, essentially this is the philosophy like that all the Flume guys, High Star, all those guys have taken. Okay. So this is essentially what we, when we started, was this is the, your program, and this is the program with all these primitives to what the Flume operating system needs added in. Okay. And that poor programmer has to write this all this thing in, we want to go from here to here automatically. And the other thing is the following. And when we started looking at these programs, and you know, I would send mail to the Flume mailing list uh, and Max Cohen saying, you know, what was the high level policy you guys were going for? They said, oh, maybe it's like this. So which is also kind of a bad thing. Essentially what it is is your, what policy you're trying to enforce using those primitives is kind of in the code. There's not like a somewhere sort of a declarative file which says, okay, this is the policy I'm trying to enforce with this code. Okay? So that's what we call semantic gap. Essentially, um, and actually, you know, uh, to be truthful, a lot of systems guys still feel like this. If you ask them what is their policy, they'll say go look at the code. And at least, uh, both Tom and I being PL people, we don't think that's sort of the right tack. 
Okay, so that's kind of what we uh, we want to bridge this uh, semantic gap, where you give us policies in a sort of a separate declarative language, and you give us the uninstrumented program, and out comes the instrumented program. Okay, uh, I am not. Uh, so we had this paper called Secure What I Mean, where you give us the C program, you give us some semantics about what the flume primitives mean, and you give us a policy about what flows are allowed, what are disallowed, and we give you those, what, we give you another program, which essentially you can run on flume and that will satisfy that policy. Okay. <clears throat> So this is how it works. You give us a program and a policy. We generate a set of constraints. Uh, looking at the C program, the language semantics, and the program policy. And also we look at the flume semantics. What does it mean for the various primitives? And it will become clear in the examples that I will consider. And. Um, also the policy language semantics. And these set of constraints go into an SMT solver. Uh, how many of you are familiar with what a satisfiability modular solver is? I mean, I can give you a little bit of a. So there has been a huge, uh, and let me just finish the slide and then. And then the sol essentially the solver is used to satisfy, to solve those set of constraints essentially. And what the solver does gives you a solution which are you use for the placement. So, so the program is similar, right? Uh, the program that you started with is similar. Yeah, yeah, it's just vanilla C. It's vanilla C. So uh, one thing, uh, go ahead. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my god, no, 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 yeah. We are not doing it on binary. We have access to source code. Uh, that's binary is uh, yet another. I mean, uh, the thing is, remember, like Apache is, I don't know how much, like a couple of million lines. Uh, I think uh, it would have trouble scaling up. I don't think binary analysis, uh, I don't know, when you compile two million lines, I don't know how big is the binary, but I think it's pretty big. And then most binary analysis tools uh, won't scale up to that. So, yeah, actually, uh, that's a very good point. As I've said, the source code is available. Now, uh, just sort of a little bit primer about the SMT solver. Um, so there's this huge, uh, I mean, we all know uh, SAT uh, is NP-complete, but there has been a huge, uh, how should I say, but most instances that come up in verification problems are easy, where like a resolution style sort of stuff finds satisfying assignment. And uh, these SMT solvers have really leveraged that. They have other theories of like linear constraints and all that built in. It goes to this old work of Nelson Open and so on, to the point where um, actually, I mean, we have quite very large constraint solvers, and we can just throw it at the SMT solver Z3, and it, uh, it sort of is able to solve it. So there has been a huge community that has been trying to uh, you know, make this really uh, efficient, and we are sort of using that as a constraint solving uh, problem. But there are some encoding tricks which I'm uh, going to talk about to do that. But think about SMT solver as essentially just a black box we are using to solve the set of constraints. Any questions about that? I mean, uh, by the way, one, uh, if you're interested in that, a lot of uh, sort of communities, for example, like the, a lot of the AI planning community and all that have all switched to, there's no need to have these planners that are very, very specific to your problem. A lot of them have actually switched to SAT solvers. Uh, because you can just sort of bit blast it down, and uh, you know you can uh, s sort of uh, do it. For example, the graph plan of Avram Blum and those guys. Okay, so back to our example. Uh, this is our. Uh, this is again. That is the that is the small sort of that web module that I talked about. This is the insecure program. I don't know, the arrow is not showing here, but the a policy here is that the worker cannot talk to the network. The requester should be able to talk to the worker, and the requester should be able to talk to the sp spawner. It will go through what we call a policy weaver, and out comes a secure program where, look, these are the primitives that the flume guy needs. And essentially, our transformation makes sure that this satisfies the policy. 
Mm -hmm. So that's a very important. Uh, so that is so that is a very important point. I think this is maybe what you were getting at. That vocabulary is tied to the program. Yeah. yeah. So that's uh, uh, the vocabulary that we use in the policy. Like what is a worker? What's a network? You we have a way of tying that back to the code fragment over there. For example, saying every process that is spawned using this is a worker, or so on. So is that is that what you were asking? That the, the yeah. So that. No, no, so you have to write, so for example, you have to write the sort of the connection, what it means to be a worker. So, yeah, 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 you have to do that. Go ahead. Oh, so it is all a sort of a how much you, I mean, do you think writing that code this one is harder than writing these things, right? I mean, and, and, and I claim that at least from the case studies we had done, the policy and writing these bindings were much smaller than the actual Flume code that was generated. No, no, no. Well, again, I, I, said, I think you don't get too hung up on the example. The, the, essentially, the, the, your question boils down to is that, is writing this simpler than actually generating that sort of the flume primitive itself? Uh, yes, uh, to the point where actually the, there are these principles that we talk about, worker network, you have to tie it to specific uh, sort of code fragments and spawn. For example, you need to tell us that at this point when you spawn something, I'm going to call it a worker. Yes. Yeah. But again, I think the value judgment is, is that harder to do than that? And actually, you know, the amount of code we generate for that, I mean, so that's, again, Yes. What happens in that case? Oh, so you have, you'll have to, so if you run this, we haven't thought about that. So what you're asking is if you update this, uh, at this point, you have, you have to kind of rerun your swim program. You have to rerun swim to get the flume version of that. Okay, so, so the thing is, at least from what we saw in a lot of those change histories is these are big enough structural things. We, they, they do, they're pretty, pretty sort of stable. Uh, I think the, so the internal mechanics we don't need. I mean, that is, that is handled by the static analysis. But that's a good question. I mean, that's a value judgment. And essentially, uh, you know, this was sort of, um, at least what we saw is the amount of code that you have to write there was much more than what you had to write here. Okay, um, the other thing is, one thing with the SAP solvers that is very interesting is that if the set of constraints is unsatisfiable, oh, uh, Fabian. Yeah, yeah, actually I have some experimental results at the end. Uh, one thing that we found very interesting is uh, that if the, uh, if the set of constraints is unsatisfiable, so there is no way you can satisfy this policy, the SAT solvers give you an unsat core, which essentially is the smallest core of the constraints that was kind of led to the unsatisfiability. And we actually, that's one thing we have not looked at too much, but that is a very good, at least uh, that is a very good way to look at, okay, why the heck was these, these policies not satisfiable? And we found it very instructive, actually, to look at it. And you will see an example of that in, in sort of my example. So in some cases, there was sort of an inconsistency between the sort of the flow constraints that we give, and you just can't satisfy it. So you have to do something like refactor the program. Okay? And you will see it. Um, so again, this is where, this is what we want to do. We want to go from there to there, given modulo those policies. Okay? So... Uh, this is how it's going to look. We will give you a program, we'll give you a security policy, and then it goes through our instrumenter, and you go through a secure program. Okay? 
And if the say, policies are not satisfiable, we show you the set of small constraints, which actually you can map it down to the fragment of the program, saying, OK, because of this fragment and these policies, we couldn't satisfy it. Well, you know, so imagine you, you are a systems guy, you, you, know, you take Apache and you want to say, I want to have this policy. So I, I'm assuming, so, so if, you're, if you want to run this program on Flume, they, that's the person writing sort of this policy. Are you, are, are you getting at whether these are easy to write or hard to write? Or? So for example, I mean, I don't know. <coughs> No, no, the policy is a static thing. If you, and, but, yeah. Um, but I think that the enforcement is dynamic. At, 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 uh, is it? Okay, so that's essentially what we are going to cover uh, in this uh, sort of talk. Okay, so this is, again, this is our mock thing. That network flow is not, anything in red means essentially think about security, that those flows are not allowed. Green means those flows should be allowed in the system. Okay, so those are the flows that uh, apply to those, those parts of the system. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is what I'm going to first talk about challenge of instrumentation. So the whole idea is that remember we want to do the, this statically so first thing what you want to do is, and I'm going to talk about some of the flume primitives, and maybe that'll answer your stuff. You have to understand how these, you somehow have to um, represent how do these flume primitives work, sort of the semantics of these primitives. If we don't get that, we can't do anything. So you have to kind of first encode all those diff C mechanics. And let's sort of think about that a little bit. And this is my two slide tutorial about how the flume diff C mechanics works. And, Essentially, what happens is each process will get uh, some, some labels, and labels are just set of tags. Think about tags as atomic elements, and labels are just set of tags. And this guy, if that guy also has label A, so this is a tag, this is a label, you can have A, B, C, and so on. This guy, if it tries to send a message to P2 through the OS, inter-process communication, if this thing is a subset of that, it is allowed. If, if, you, if this had an empty tag, then if you try to send the message, it's not allowed. Okay? So that's the simple, there are other sort of bells and whistles to Flume, but the basic idea is that the process gets a label, which is a set of tags, and if it tries to send a message over a channel to another process, it can only do so if the current tag of the process, uh, label of the process, is a superset of this guy. That's essentially. And if you want to think about it in a lattice theoretic way, then uh, essentially it's the subset relation going up in the lattice. Good. So raise a low label means you can read more. OK. So now we can't, I mean, think about P1, P2. This is, this is not our work. This is just giving you a slight idea about the flume semantics, how the flume div, uh, works. So P1 can't send a message to P2 now because this is not a subset of that. Okay. What flume guys also do, and this goes back to actually old work of Andrew Myers and Barbara Liskov and these guys, where they allow you something which they call sort of positive and negative capabilities where you can add and drop some labels. They give you sort of a privilege to add and drop labels. So let's say you give that P2 the privilege to add a label A, a tag A. Then essentially what it can do is it can add 
a tag A, and now it can receive a message from that. It is, but I think you will see that I can also drop tags. So a lot of the declassify work, which corresponds to declassify, I think was more formalized by, uh, at least what I've seen, it was declassify was not sort of new, but it was this kind of diff C type tag and so on. It was more sort of cleaner done by Myers and Liskov. Uh -huh. Okay, you'll see, you'll see. Yeah. Okay, so the, uh, again, I want to say this is this is kind of just the semantics of the flume uh, primitive. This is not our work yet. I mean, this, I'm just describing to you how the flume primitives work, and I, essentially what you're getting at is there's a lot of this debate in this sort of the security community, diff C versus capability, and I, the, the my whole thing is that's exogenous to our work. We are taking these primitives as they are, and yes, you you can so sort of, there's a lot of criticism that oh you know. Why not use capability based and so on? But this is just, I'm describing you the flume, sort of how the primitives work. And I'll show you how to do the synthesis of it. It, it does, actually. So that we'll, we'll tie that back. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and the essentially, now you can send it. But then also, what you can do is you can lower your label. And this is what declassify, and this is sort of where a lot of the Myers-Liskov work comes in, is for example, now at some point you want, don't want P1 to receive a message from P2. So what you're gonna do is, you're gonna, or, or you don't want P1 to communicate with the network, you would give it a negative capability, and you will remove A from that tag, and suddenly it can send a message to A. Oh. Or it can actually, <laughs> sorry. It can send a message because what, what happened initially, it added the tag, it got A. Now it can remove this, so it's an empty tag, and it can send a message to network. Okay? So, so essentially, this is not our work. This is Flume. So Flume essentially has, just to recap, it has labels, which are a set of tags, but it has these capabilities to either drop the tags or add the tags. Okay? And uh, adding the tag means you can read more. Um, Dropping a tag means you can send to more people, declassify. Okay, that's, this is not, again, uh, um, so this is just describing the diff C mechanics of flow. Okay. And so in our case, it is going to look like this. I'm going to um, assign an empty label to this and um, a label A to this and label empty to the network so the worker can't send over the network, right? Um, can anybody say why can't, why did I have a negative capability for the, the worker? Why can't the worker has a negative? So that means it can't drop the tag A. Exactly, so otherwise what it can do is it can just drop that tag and send to the network. Uh, okay. But do you, see, do you see a problem here? So what happens is uh, requester can't talk to the network. Requester can send stuff to the worker, but the worker can't send to the net, uh, requester. But our functionality constraint says the requester and worker should be able to talk to each other. Okay. So what these guys do is, and this is kind of, I call it a escape hatch or they essentially refactor, and they put a proxy, and essentially requester and worker can talk through the proxy. Okay, so essentially think about this refactoring as that those constraints were not you; uh, th those constraints could not be satisfiable unless you put a proxy between requester and worker. And essentially, if you look at the proxy it can add and raise the label as it wishes so it can talk to both requester and the worker, okay? 
Now, what we want to do is we want to come up with this kind of labeling and refactoring automatically. That's, that's our, our uh, sort of claim. And um, later on, we will uh, we'll sort of, and I'll show you how to get here, not by sort of just writing uh, things, but actually through very systematic program analysis techniques. OK? So we want to instrument DIFF-C code that is legal, secure, and functional. Uh, and I'm going to first just sort of look through this. Um, OK, first let's talk about how to generate constraints whose, that will give you those labels. Uh, let's just look at the spawner for now, which looks like this. Connection request comes. And then essentially, you just spawn the worker. Essentially, what our static analysis technique does is for each program point, it assigns a variable. So lab one essentially is the label of the program just before that statement. Pause one is the positive capability just before the statement. And negative is the negative capability just before the statement. And create one are all the tags you're going to create at that point. So the, for every program point, we will have these four variables in our static analysis. And then what we'll do is we'll have constraints that will connect those variables. And then we will have a constraint solver that will solve it and whose solution will tell us what to do. Okay? And so that's what I'm going to go through now. So same thing at that program point. Okay. Um, okay what, um, so... What does this constraint say? Lab two subset of lab one union pause one. Essentially, all you can do, let's say if this was after this, label set was lab, lab one here. You can only increase the label set by what you have the positive capability of. So this gives you the constraint that lab two cannot get higher than label one and what are the positive capabilities you have, right? And this is essentially the, the blue constraints are going to model the diff-C primitives that are going to be. Does, is that constraint clear? Oh, because we want to use subset constraints. Because, you know, I might, I might decide to add less. We don't, we don't have to add all of them, right? Uh, and in general, though, uh, subset constraints are easier to solve than. But and in some sense, it uh, also makes sense to me because you might add only a subset of the tags that you can. You don't have to add all of them. This just gives you the capability to add it. OK. Um, what about this? This is, goes the other way. It says that, hey, I, might, I was a label one here. I might reduce some of them. So that gives me a lower, lower bound on lab two. So all these constraints are doing is modeling how the diff-C primitives work, the diff-C semantics of uh, Flume. Uh, and similarly, pause2 is a subset of pause1, pause-create. This says that your positive capability here is limited by the positive capability here and what of the tags you created at that point. So just think about, what about secure? Uh, let me flash this constraint. Um, what does this constraint? So I think it's better to do the negation first. So this essentially says that if, you're, if your constraint of the worker is lab W and you remove, you drop some of the tags, and if that becomes subset of lab N, then it can send messages to the network. So the negation of that is what you want, because that's a constraint that you don't want satisfied. And now we come to functional constraint. You want requester to talk to the worker, and that essentially is pretty simple. Is lab W is a subset of lab R. Lab R is a subset of lab W. Okay. There, there's some other complications with the constraint. So what we do is we just collect all these constraints in a constraint system. So you do a, you do a walkthrough of the control flow graph, and you get these giant set of constraints. And you think, hey, you know, this, this thing is too big. But uh, most of the SMT solvers are able to chunk through it pretty quickly. We had some things in the paper to reduce these set of constraints. So um, these set of constraints, 
we then just give it to a SAT solver, SMT solver, and actually it comes back saying that it is not satisfiable. Not only that, it actually gives you the unsat core, which is sort of a subset of these constraints that actually led to the, the thing. And you can see why that is. I mean, these three is what led to the unsatisfiable. And actually, this is where some of the new work comes in. This actually led us to saying that we have to actually put the proxy in there. That, that unsat core actually uh, sort of gives you a very strong indication that you have to add this proxy between the requester and the worker. Okay, now let's talk about the solving the constraints. Uh, in general, uh, the set of subset constraint, uh, what the set of constraints that we generate are called subset constraints, uh, is NP complete. And essentially, it is NP complete because we have two kind of subset constraints. One are subset constraints. The other was also negation of subset constraints. Remember, the security was the negation of that. So we have both. We have monotonic, which is this is a subset of that. And we also have negation of that. So it's NP complete because of one reason, because we have our constraints had both monotonic and sort of um, you know, not monotonic constraints. Okay, if, if it, you were only considering one case, like the functional constraint, it's actually monotonic and it can be solved in polynomial time. Okay, this is amenable to SMT solvers in practice. And we actually did that. And uh, how would you, so, so the way we was actually did that is, let's say I got that solution from my SMT solver. It says lab one is neg, uh, empty, pause one is empty, neg one is empty, create one is A. Then I know that because create one is A, I have to instrument the code to create a tag, right? And the same thing here. If, if I um, have lab two A, positive capability A, negative capability empty, create empty, then I have to spawn a worker with that label and give it that positive capability. So all, all I'm trying to say here is that the SMT solver solution that I get very clearly says what, how to instrument the program. There isn't a big leap there. Um, and and uh, essentially this is kind of the label set and we got, we got to this picture automatically by looking at the SMT solver. There was a, a um, before we get into the applications, and maybe this is going to answer your sort of question, uh, Fabian, there was a slight technical problem here. Um, so what is the easiest way to uh, bit blast these set of constraints out to SMT? I'm going to say, I'm going to have a set of 20 tags. And each label is just a subset of these 20 tags. So I, I can write that as bit vector. And when I bit, bit blast it down, so do, does anybody see a problem with that? So I say, okay, you know what? I'm going to limit myself to 30 tags. Each of those subset constraint becomes essentially a bit vector uh, sort of formula. All those set of constraints, I conjunct them, and then I give to SMT solver. The problem is, how do you know 30 is, 30 is not?